Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Night Writer podcast. I'm really uh, happy to introduce our special guest for this episode, Ryan Fitzgerald. Hi, Ryan. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming on. Um, so, yeah, quick disclaimer, actually, before we, before we launch in, if you're watching on the, on the YouTube channel. Um, so we're going to be talking about horror stuff. Um, which probably isn't going to be very easy to listen to. But then if you're listening to this podcast, we don't talk about happy stuff anyway. So you've been warned. So Ryan, welcome to the show. Yes, thank you. Um, so you are a huge horror fan, as I've gathered. Yes, most definitely. And when we spoke um, by email, you mentioned something about Lovecraftian horror. Mm-hmm. As the, for, for those people who don't know what Lovecraftian is, could you just explain to us? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so Lovecraftian horror comes from H.P. Lovecraft, the author, who um, kind of um, started this whole style and genre of horror where um, the horror just comes from what we can't comprehend. Like all of the, all of the monsters and everything in, in, in Lovecraft horror are not easily describable in the text and that's because they're created in such a way that um the human brain isn't meant to comprehend them and if you ever like see it then you would just go insane so it's it's a lot of like uh creatures and concepts from deep space out of our like depths of reality kind of like the fear of the unknown um but but yeah so so it's a little different than um than like jump scare horror or or any really anything else it's like it's a another term for it is is weird fiction or cosmic horror yeah um because that's exactly what it is <laughs> is there is there an example in particular that's like a favorite of yours a lovecraftian horror um that's a great question well i guess this is also just a good example of lovecraft horror um you have like the stories of of cthulhu um in the mouth of madness um, which is a kind of a great example of that. Uh, one of my favorites actually is one that wasn't even written by um, Lovecraft because it's one that uh, inspired some some of my work. Um, I might have mentioned it in in the email, yeah. but um, there was a another writer named Robert Chambers who, in 1895, he released a collection of uh, short horror stories under the title of um, the King in Yellow. And it's all just based around this, um, these people who read this play. And when you read the play, you go mad. And there's never really a description of what's in the play. Um, You get like very brief little snippets of like dialogue from the play, but no real like plot or anything. And um, within that is um, this idea of the yellow sign. um, That's like a part of the play. And if you ever see the yellow sign, you go mad. And so, um, the idea of the king in yellow has kind of been like adapted into all kinds of forms over time. And it, I, it was very much inspired by Lovecraft. Um, but again, it wasn't written by Lovecraft. Um, so you kind of see the concepts pop up in, in a lot of different interesting places. The first season of True Detective, um, the main villain was called the Yellow King and like all of his things were a little bit based off of it. Right. And uh, it, it pops up in a lot of popular role-playing games, I know. Um, there's some cool like ARG alternate reality games I think that are are based off of it, and um, and I also used it in in one of the scripts that I wrote. So I, I would say personally that that's a, that's a favorite of mine. I mean that sounds really fascinating. The idea that you can just like someone can read a play and then they go mad, but you don't know why, and there's no mm-hmm. explanation, and that's the point of. of mm-hmm yeah uh what you're trying to do but yeah. then but then going on to what you say you write and your work and your projects um how i, I can imagine it must be quite hard then to create something like this entity that you that no one really knows what it's about because then you have the job of trying to convince your audience that it's this thing but then to you as the as no the, exactly what it is that's as uh, just between you and mm-hmm. your mind you know it's, i just really want to pick your brain about that yeah, no, exactly. In fact, um, I, I know that on, on your last episode, you had Lars Henriks on to talk. Yeah, yeah. And this is actually a really good little plug for me is that on the next episode of my podcast, um, I will also have Lars Henriks on. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> nice little crossover. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but I asked him the same exact thing in, in our conversation. I was like, it's, it's so weird that, that we, we, I, I'm, I'm putting myself in there, but I really mean like actual accomplished, like filmmakers and stuff. Um, keep trying to adapt Lovecraft when the whole point of it is that it can't be like visual. There's no way to like really convey that. That's something that only works in, in text. Um, and so I was asking him about that and, um, and, and yeah, he, he made some, he made some, some good points. Um, our conversation was a little while ago, but one was that his, his kind of response to it was in some of his movies to kind of just go into, um, kind of go into a, a silly, a silly area, like take it so far that, um, it almost no longer becomes scary at some points it just like it would warp your mind i guess in a way that it's just it's it's almost comical in some scenes i don't know if you've seen any of his movies but um um there's definitely moments like that in it but um but yeah and, and another interesting thing about that is um uh, a movie that came out not too long ago based off of a lovecraft work um was called the the color out of space i don't know if you saw it had nicholas cage in it um well anyway the 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 basic 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 gist of that is that there is a color that comes from space but it's a color that we have never seen and the human mind like can't really comprehend it it's not like on our it's not like in a rainbow it's not on our color spectrum or anything and um and so i, I was talking to Lars about that um but what they did was they just kind of made it this like they use like a shade of pink which is a unique shade of pink. And there's some like color theory out there that like pink is a, a very intrinsically interesting color just because of um, its properties. And it's in some ways it's like closer to green. It, uh, this is all stuff that I read on like Wikipedia a very long time ago. So I'm really butchering this, but um, you know, that's really like the, the best you can do is you have to take something that, is incomprehensible to human beings and put it into human terms. And so you will always lose something in translation about that. So it's kind of always just like a fight of, you know, what can you do to um, substantiate that and kind of find another way to elevate it. And, and um, you know, there've been a lot of really good um, attempts. I, I don't know if there's ever an example that has actually like perfectly nailed it in the way that like it's just written to also, Disclaimer, I'm talking a lot about H.P. Lovecraft and saying a lot of good things about him. I want to say H.P. Lovecraft was not a great person. Okay. You know, he was from like the 1920s or whatever. And uh, he had a lot of ideas that were not so good. So I just want to make that disclaimer. Yeah. I like a lot of his work. I don't like him as a person. <laughs> That's fine. We're talking about the, the art, yes. not the artist. Yes. Okay. I just thought that was, you know, yeah, just want to throw that out. Yeah. I mean... Maybe that, do you think that could have influenced him, his ideology, do you reckon? I mean, there's definitely, I don't want to get into specifics, there are some things that pop up in some of his books that, that are very straightforwardly, uh, not horror related, but they are kind of just him speaking his mind on a couple of things that he thought at the time. Um, just his perspective on certain types of people, which are not great and are thankfully always left out of every adaptation. Oh, good, good. Because <laughs> um, when I was kind of researching a bit on the Lovecraftian stuff, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't realize that I, I was kind of into it until I typed it in Google and started researching it. I don't mm -hmm. know, for me, what, what the first thing that came up in my mind was Sauron from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, that's an interesting example. Because he's not, example. he's not like, um, he's like this, supposed to be this kind of, I think Tolkien created him as this, this immortal mm -hmm. thing. Um, and then he was, he was on the side of good, and then he just kind of fell. But went into evil um which i find quite fascinating just the villain backstory of, of things mm -hmm. but yeah j that was the first thing that came to my mind because he wasn't really an actual person he was just kind of this yeah and, and then he exists in the ring and and all that kind of stuff yeah it's interesting the it's almost like the the monsters used in in lovecraft are just like they're just concepts almost they're they're just the closest visual concepts that are visual representations that anyone can make of these like concepts. That's why um, Cthulhu, whenever he's described or shown is 
big green thing, like tiny wings, octopus face, just like an amalgamation of, of everything because that's the only thing you can like really picture at all. Um, but yeah, I feel like I might have lost my train of thought a little bit there. But. And now we talk about um, Lord of the Rings, uh, Sauron. Yeah. yeah, it's been a very long time since I've watched Lord of the Rings. But, but yeah, Sauron, he's just like big eye, right? Yes. I mean, initially when he appears because he basically can um, form into anything he can take the form of anything mm -hmm. um, and shape shift and stuff so I didn't know if that if that was part of yeah I would I would I would bet that um Tolkien probably took some inspiration from Lovecraft um a lot of he had a very heavy hand in influencing a lot of um horror and just like fantasy in general um it's, it's interesting how, well, I mean, because, you know, the idea of the concept of um, this thing that isn't there, this entity mm -hmm. that isn't there, and then it really does play with your psych a lot, because um, the king in yellow, that's yes. awesome. that idea of you're reading something, and then it, you go mad, there's always going to be one skeptic that goes, oh, no, I, I, I'm fine, like, this is just all in your head, and then, yeah, yeah, and then they read it, and then, and then you just want to figure out, well, what is this? What? Yeah, well, the scariest part to me about that, the concept of the play itself and then also the yellow sign, um, is that you could just, you could see it or read it and not even realize it. Like, if you're just walking down an alley and someone just, like, were to graffiti the yellow sign on a wall or something and you just happen to glance at it, like, like that's it, you're crazy, and you might not even be able to pinpoint why. It's just yeah. something that's so easy to, like, get into you, and I think that's why it... it was like scary to me at least it's interesting how they all use colors as well like color is supposed to be a trigger for these yeah like, yeah and yellow is a very like kind of like sickly color personally i just i don't like the color yellow yeah, yeah. It's, it's not the great out of the spectrum but yeah yeah um but that that story actually reminded me i don't know if you heard the story of the depressed mickey mouse oh is this like a is this is this like a creepypasta yeah. kind of thing yeah okay story um yeah, I don't remember the exacts, but I, I, yeah, I've seen all those kind of like. So it's the one where um he's yeah. like walking like this, like really, mm -hmm. best, and I think one of the filmmakers watched it and then he went and like shot himself. And anyone who watches it, they end up killing themselves or something like that. It was one mm -hmm. of those kind of things that just reminded me of, of that. Yeah, and it yeah. reminded me of The Ring as well. You know, when you watch that, you know, like, yeah, The Ring is actually that's 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 not a bad comparison because it's. Yeah, you see a videotape and then you you end up dying. And it doesn't matter what you do, you've seen the tape, it's gonna kill you. Yeah. So that's actually a pretty that's actually a very good, very good point of comparison. Um in a kind of I almost feel bad making this like making this comparison because it's something that did actually happen, but um it could almost in a way tie into this, but I still feel bad and I'm gonna like while I'm talking, I just wanna fact check myself real quick but i recently saw a um a commercial for i think it's domino's um i think it's domino's pizza are you familiar with the noid no as a, as a mascot character no um explain what's the noise the noid was <laughs> a mascot for domino's in like the late 80s and 90s something like that and he's basically just like this guy in like a red suit looked like he had rabbit ears and he was called annoyed because he would get annoyed if his pizza was late or something and they had a whole like marketing thing for this but um but then there was someone who was suffering from a lot of uh, uh mental mental issues not doing well um and his last name happened to be noid and he saw the commercial all the commercials and thought that they were specifically targeting him and making fun of him. So then he, in like a, in like a frenzied state after seeing the commercial, he's like, I think he went to a Domino's and like, and shot up the place. He like killed a bunch of people. Oh, God. And so after that, they, they stopped using the ad. They stopped running the Noid until recently, I guess I saw him starting popping up again. And I just, so I've been like thinking about them like, Oh, that's interesting. I guess enough time has passed. Really? They're doing, they're still doing that? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe like, maybe like all the lawsuits have been settled or something. I'm not sure, but you know that that's kind of another example of like being driven by a piece of 
art or media you see. And also saying that, I want to make the point of comparison that um, I also, I, I do not believe that like video games can make you go violent. I was just about to bring up that subject that you read. Yeah, like, whenever, when... I was like, follow home with that. Like, so what do you think of like Call of Duty, Assassin? Yeah, I realized I was leading myself down that path. <laughs> and also I want to say, um, I don't think the Noid commercial actually caused that guy to do that. He very much needed help already and was already suffering from a lot of things before those commercials yeah. uh, aired. Um, I just happened to be the push on it, the- it, it happened to be like the, the trigger that like put him over the edge. Um, they didn't do that. They didn't know, oh, by the way, there's going to be someone out there called that. Like they, they had yeah. no idea. Of course not. How would they? I yeah. wouldn't even guess there would be someone with the last name of Noy. What is, what is the origin of that? I don't even know. Um, but yeah, so uh, that happened. Video games don't cause violence. If you're gonna, if if you're gonna go out and do something tragic based off of something that you see, you were probably already going to do that anyway, and you should have gotten help a long time ago. Yes. But and that's then, just some real life horror to throw in there. Well, no, I mean that happens too, and then mm-hmm. I know a lot of people do blame and say oh, it was this and it was that video game or, or that horror movie, which you know horror movies get blamed a lot for that. Yeah, I know. It's, it's um, dumb. Horror movies are great. <laughs> It's great escapism. Um, so what was your favorite? I mean, are you fans of like the paranormal? Because I know you mentioned that earlier, that it's not the same as, as Lovecraftians, but are you asking just paranormal genre movies or paranormal activity specifically? Oh, we, we could talk about both because they're both- I actually I have not seen the paranormal activity movies. I've not seen any of them. I've, I've um, seen one. Only one. That's more than an, that was enough. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've, I'm not opposed to them, I just haven't seen them. I personally um, prefer the Blair Witch because I think that was yes. Oh, that was like up there is probably for the longest that. time. Um, for the longest time, the Blair Witch Project was my absolute favorite horror movie until I saw Hereditary, which was very recent. And really? have you seen Hereditary? Yeah, that's the one with uh, Tony Collette in it, right? Yes. That replaced Blair Witch for you? <laughs> okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Oh, is, wow. um, <laughs> after I, I, okay. So after I saw, <laughs> so I saw Hereditary uh, uh, with my girlfriend, and um, then after we like kept telling people about like, oh my god, this is like really scary. So I have a lot of friends who like went to watch it based off of my recommendation, and they also do not like it. They think it's really <laughs> dumb. Which, I, and I, I get the feeling that you feel that as well. I, I'll um, speak off you. Speak. <laughs> but this, yeah, but this is also kind of an example of how like you know, it's just like comedy horror is like the most subjective thing. What's gonna like scare one person is not gonna scare another. But my my personal experience with Hereditary was we went to go see it at like in 11 p.m. showtime at a theater, and and it's the it it really is the only movie the only scary movie where while the movie was going on I wanted them to stop playing it because I was getting scared and I think it's because and this is something that I really appreciate about Hereditary is that nothing really scary happens in it until like halfway through there's no real like horror in it until halfway through yeah but that first half leading up to it is like it's it's just emotionally draining it's just all of this like family drama there's a lot of tragedies that happen within the family. There's no communication. It's a lot of stress buildup. And by the time the horror actually happens, my just like immune system to horror had been so broken down from the stress and like trauma of just the family stuff that when it started doing scary things, it like really hit me. Um, and and it, uh, it, in my view, Hereditary kind of accomplished... Um, a lot of things that I really love in horror and I don't see all that often, um, which is that uh, just the idea of there like being something in a room that you don't see at first and maybe by the time the scene is over, you do see it or maybe you don't, but it was there the whole time. And then when you realize it's there, you're like, oh my God, that thing has been with me this entire time. There are a few scenes like that um, like towards the end of the movie, I forget the characters' names, but um, one of the Naked Brother Band's boy, the the something Wolf, the Nat Wolf or Alex Wolf, one of them yeah. who's in the movie. Um, it's towards the end. A lot of stuff has happened. He like wakes up in his room, um, 
it's completely dark and he's just kind of sitting in his bed and the scene is like 45 seconds to a minute long of just him sitting there and it wasn't until like 50 seconds in that I realized oh his mother is like hanging in the corner of his room just like up up against the wall just watching him the entire time and that's the stuff that really scares me um and also I like that because because when I write stuff I don't know how to write that yeah it's I don't hard. know how to I yeah. don't know how to write something that um that is supposed to be there but you're not supposed to see I can never figure that out yeah, because you want to try and convey it to like the actors and the people there because they are your audience yeah. and they have to like understand what they're doing. But then at the same time, it's like you have to be very technical. You say, okay, so this thing, but we can't see it. But the audience. Yeah, even the person like giving, like reading it or giving like coverage on it, um, I want them to like have the same or something similar to the, the, the scary effect of it. But how am I supposed to write? Oh, and this is there, but just don't worry about it. Just don't think about yeah. it too much right now. <laughs> and the director will be like, um, you're stepping on my toes, but this is my job to make sure it's, it's this. So you just yeah. write the story. Exactly um, that as well. But going back to Hereditary, I mean, I saw it in probably about two o'clock in the afternoon mm -hmm. at Leicester in Leicester Square. It was like pretty empty. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I loved the trailer. I thought I was like, I was like, oh, yes, I have to watch this movie. And then it opened like a dollhouse. I thought, oh, this is great. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, like all this family drama starts happening and the acting was, was great. There's no denying that. It's just the ending that lost me. <laughs> I, and that's what stayed with me when I was walking up the stairs. I'm like, how long have I sat through this movie for? You know what I read recently? Is that um, maybe it's just some versions of the movie, but they, I think they, I might be wrong with it. I haven't watched it since I was in theaters, but I think I read that they added like a voiceover to the ending of the movie. Do you remember that when you saw it or something? Um, I haven't seen it again since I left that. Okay, yeah. I, you know what I'm talking about? Obviously, I'm not going to spoil it, but it, they're in this. It's like a thing. Oh, actually, I do think I remember there was a, as a voiceover. I think it's her talking about the. the yeah, I, you see, I think when I saw it, I don't think there was a voiceover. I read that like because of like test audiences or something. Yeah. Yes. They no, might have, I like, added that. that in. There was a voiceover. It was either her or the grandmother talking about who the guy becomes. You know who he becomes and who he's meant to be. Yeah. Maybe that wasn't when I saw it. I don't know. I got but, that. This but, just um, out of nowhere, and then I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I've had a nice little day. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. go. But another thing, another thing that I liked about Hereditary was that um, I, I, I hate in, in horror movies when there are no rules. You know what I mean? Like if the bad guy just seems like, oh, he can do anything. Oh, the ghost can do anything. There's no like limits or there's no like rules laid out. Like you think you have an understanding of what's going on and suddenly like, oh no, he can also do this. And yeah, it's like a human thing and yeah. Yeah. Um you almost get that feeling with hereditary where um like you have no idea what's going on with this like cult or like what all these little things are that they're doing or why they're even there. And maybe this is just like my personal like experience of it, but I got the feeling that like I understood that there were rules to everything but I just wasn't aware of what they were. And that made it scarier to me that these things are operating by a set of rules and I'm just not like privy to them. Yeah. So it kind of felt like if I had this like handbook to understand what was going on that all of these people do have, it might've like, it might help me, but because I didn't, that's just like taking away something that, um, that would have, that would have helped me, I guess. Yeah, and that's something that I did like about it, actually. I mean, so while we're on that, um, yeah. what, so what I've talked about actually, like my early, like first season of my podcast, I did mm -hmm. something on Amityville horror, and I like talking about all those kind of stuff, which mm -hmm. is going to Ed and Lorraine Warren. Um, for people who don't <laughs> know, they are ghost yes. hunters. They are paranormal experts. I put that in quotes. You good quotes. Good quotes to use. Yeah, um, and Lorraine Warren actually passed away. I think two years ago. Oh, really? Oh, um, I didn't know that. Okay. Because they dedicated the final Annabelle film to her. Mm. Um, and yeah, she was like a psychic and he was a priest or he was like a, a religious guy. He, he would do exorcisms around and they were a married couple and mm. they would just go around houses and, and they had haunted dolls. Um, yeah, Annabelle the doll based on a real life doll called Robert the yeah, doll. Yeah, they have a whole museum of stuff. Yeah, of all these objects. And their famous case was Amityville. 
and when I was doing research on Amityville, I obviously it was a horrible thing that happened. You know, this, this guy basically um, shot his his whole family, wanted to fail. And when I kind of went over it and over it, like both sides, and he. I think he lied and said that he had voices made him do it, but I don't know if he was just on, on drugs or any of that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And then after they left, the Lutz family moved in and then, then they said that things were flying around and all this kind of stuff. And they made so much money off of it. <laughs> so much oh, yeah. money. They merged the hell out of Amityville and it's become this thing. So much so that the actual family have been forgotten, like the original. the defense. Yeah, it's all about the house now. Yeah, it's all about the house. And now the people who live in, in that house they just want to be left alone. And they've said nothing's happened to them. Nothing's happened. Mm-hmm. All that kind of stuff. I suppose what I'm asking is where do you stand on that kind of, because, um, you know, you hear things about haunted. I mean, even talking to Lars, I mean, he's, he said it about mm-hmm. his, his hometown. Um, did just things happen and you can't. Explain. Are you just asking if I believe in like ghosts and haunting? And Basically, stuff? I'm trying to ask in a really nice way. Do you believe in ghosts? <laughs> 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 um. Actually, I, I don't. I, I, I don't believe in. I don't believe in ghosts or anything. I um. I learned about this really interesting kind of concept and phenomenon a little while ago of tulpas. Are you familiar with a tulpa? No. Okay, a tulpa is um, it is a thought form energy ghost, which basically means it is not a ghost from anything that has ever lived and then died. It is a ghost or a spirit or whatever that was created solely from Thoughtful. a lot of people thinking about it enough. You think it into existence and then you kind of manifest it and like you manifest your own hauntings in a way. Yeah, and I, I don't, I still don't think I believe in that, but I think that's, that, that's a, it's a, it's a closer approximation. I like that idea more. Yeah. That's more, be- yeah. that's more believable than an actual ghost. Yeah. Cause in that you could also just kind of, say that that's like you know if everything's in your head with the hauntings then that still kind of fits with the whole tulpa thing you are like making it up in your own head so especially when you're in a, in a group you're feeding off things and yeah and- all the like energies and stuff um and the lots family they actually kept the same furniture some of the furniture yeah. in the house I'm thinking, Why would you do that? although i do have a question if you want to move into a house and just be left alone why would you move into the Amityville Horror House? Like, I feel bad for them. I think everybody has a right to privacy. But, like, that would be, like, me moving into, like, a McDonald's and being annoyed that people are coming to my house to ask for food. I know, I know because they, yeah, it's become, like, a place of pilgrimage. Um, I think it's because it's just cheap now. Like That surprises me, really? It's cheap? Mm-hmm. I would expect that to be very expensive. No one want to want to move there. And I guess mm. people who, you know, don't believe in, like, kind of, there are people mm-hmm. that or whatever, it's, it's, um, it's a nice price, livable. Let's just uh, or decorate, like knock the walls down, get rid mm-hmm. of it. Total, total. Um, yeah, but then I don't know. Like you said, you can just get, you can feed into that whole thing, and then you're lying awake at night thinking, hmm, but this was the house. Yeah, and then if you hear anything, then you're just manifesting that into a ghost or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't believe in ghosts, but I do really like ghost movies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's really a genre of scary movie that I that I don't really enjoy. Um, Have you watched the Conjuring series? Yeah. Speaking of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if I've seen. I've seen the first one. Um, how many are there now? There's. I know they're coming out with a new one. They've got this whole unit. They, they yeah, they have the Annabelle and the Nun and stuff. Um, so um, in terms of conjuring with the with the Warrens, it's yeah. one and two, and two was the Elmfield Poltergeist, which was based on a true story. Because mm-hmm. um, my dad grew up in Enfield around that time, oh. um, but I, I asked him about that. Like, do you hear anything about the Poltergeist? And he's like, no. So <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, it was, so it was set in in London, and they came over and and tried to see what to do. But I think they, they really the movie they really hi- hyped it up. Obviously, they turned it into this whole. Mm-hmm. thing which is hollywood so naturally yeah. they... are you but, a fan of the conjuring movies i actually am i i lo- i think they are brilliant with jump scares um yeah especially in the cinema i i really i couldn't like it, it gets to a point where and this is how i measure how good a horror movie is if i can't go to the bathroom at night <laughs> i'm too scared <laughs> to cross the hall mm-hmm. you've done your job mm-hmm. um because <laughs> 
I think that that demon they created, Valak or something. Oh, it was just it was it was so scary. And mm. then they, they're making it a thing, and they brought it into the nun. Um, and yeah, that's really interesting how they how they turned a horror franchise into like a Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, I, I, that, that's not something that's ever been done before. Not with horror, I don't think. Uh, well, unless you count the the like the Universal monster franchise like the wolfman and dracula yeah. and all I mean, their crossovers they were gonna do one of i think tom cruise was was heading that um oh, the they, dark universe dark universe yeah dark they <laughs> tried several times yeah tom cruise was not even the first attempt in the in the last 10 years to start that franchise it started with um well i think the very first idea for it was like in the 2010 Wolfman movie, I think. But then the real start to it was, uh, I think, 2011, 2012, something like that. Um, Dracula Untold, which did not do well at all. And then they decided to try again with The Mummy. And then that didn't do well. So now I think, so now th- I think they've handed over the idea of it to, to Blumhouse. Yeah, and then I think they're. I don't know if they're doing a connected universe because they did the um, invisible they did the Invisible Man. Man. Right, so that was the final film I've ever seen in the cinema before the pandemic. I just watched that not that long ago on HBO Max. I thought it was awesome. I, I love that. Really good. Yeah, I thought it was, it was so good. It was. It's really hard to do. I, I thought. I keep thinking that. Are they going to do? Is it going to be one of those those movies? I'm just going to sit through going, oh, gosh, but no. I thought it had the dumbest trailer. I thought it looked terrible. And then I just kept hearing all these great things. Where I was like, all right, I'll watch it. <laughs> and it was so good. But uh, now um, I think I'm actually, I think I'm wrong. Blumhouse is doing universal monster stuff, but also um, there's, they're doing some, I think they're doing some version of the invisible man with like Ryan Gosling or something, which might be another s- s- restart to a cinematic universe. I don't know. They, they just keep trying with it and it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's working for them keep making it happen um so for your for your projects are you creating a universe or is it just one by one no i'm not creating universe um i yeah so i have written like four feature length scripts and and a handful of of shorts and and there's not really a universe um i do like just taking the same names of characters and just reusing them um i don't know why i think because i started i think i i I think the first thing I wrote was like right after I watched Ex Machina. Um, which I don't know if you've seen that, but it's an amazing movie. Um, it with um, Oscar Isaac and... Yes. When and the AI, the robot. Samuel Gleason and Alicia Vikander, yeah. Yeah, and Alicia, Alicia Vikander's movie, uh, character in that movie is named Ava. And so for some reason, I don't know why, but like every script that I write, there's always like one female character named Ava. I'm not sure why. Um and I also like this idea of um, there being a late night TV show host with the name Kenny King. I don't know why. So whenever there's a late night TV show host, that's always his name. But for like an actual universe, no, I don't really, there's no real like connections or anything. But people might see the Ava thing and think, oh, it's like a connection or it's like an Easter egg. It's possible. Like an Easter egg. <laughs> if it ever got to that point, I suppose that would be possible, but. For now, they're just sitting in a drawer. So, <laughs> are you gonna like redraft and, and get out? Yeah, every once in a while, I go back to um to them. I, uh, actually, my uh my podcast, which I haven't said the name of yet, is called Hollywood Greenhorn, and we talk a lot about horror sometimes on that too. So go check that out. Um, I'll link it in the description. Oh, cool! Thank you. Um, but the basic idea for the that podcast came from um. I was doing an internship with a company and super cool guys. And my boss would like read my scripts and like give me notes on or something. And towards the end of it, um, I gave him the script that was partially based off of the King in yellow. Um, the title of that is Shakespeare and the King in yellow. And he read it. And his response to it was, this script is awesome. It will never in a million years get made. And I was like, well, okay, that's very fair. He was like super cool, super nice. He gave me like all the reasons why, but I was like, okay, so the idea for the podcast basically started by um, me just wanting to talk to people and kind of give them the script so that they could tell me why it wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, which a, a lot of a lot of the conversations I have on there are like not about the script at all, but that's just like kind of how the idea started. 
so in a way, I like to think that um, that uh, my podcast is my very, very loose adaptation of that script. <laughs> That's like what I'm doing with that one. I mean, in terms of like when, when someone says it will never get made, I mean, you can make it yourself. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, right now I'm trying to write something like extremely, extremely low budget. Because I, 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 love, I love those kinds of movies too. They're like one single location super low budget like two characters and i think you have to be like really really smart to write one of those well because otherwise it'll just be boring and i'm trying to like find a way to do that two hunters basically yeah yeah i know what you mean it's like i work in theater and um a lot of it we have to write low but low budget for low budget, so oh I write- absolutely yeah <laughs> play is like always that yeah exactly and you just think how do I kind of get these characters to get their points across without it looking a bit unnecessary? So like I wrote, I wrote this play, um, mm. which went, like you know, toured around through like London and Brighton and um, like three years ago. And it was basically uh, a, a young woman visits her dad's murderer in prison and it, it was a two-hander. But then by the end of it, loads of people, including my own grandmother, thought that they were going to end up together. And I just kind of thought, the reason for that is because they were offloading onto each other things that they would not probably not talk about in real mm-hmm. life, but they had no one else to talk to because it's just mm-hmm. them on stage. But um, so then I thought, no, okay, that okay, what have I done? But then um, yeah, now I've become expanded. That luckily the, the company I'm working with said you can just you know, oh cool, add other characters, and so they don't. So, so now that that got, the villain is more kind of a bit mm-hmm. like more threatening in that mm-hmm. sense. So it's really interesting actually how how little characters when you minimize something, how much of the story, how much they can change the audience's perception of the story. Yeah. Um, have you seen, this is a very recent movie and this is not a, this is not a horror movie at all, but now I'm just thinking of play adaptations. Um, have you seen the father? Um, not the, the, well, the Anthony Hopkins one that yes. came out. Um, no, but I, he got an Oscar for that. He did get an Oscar for that. It was a really awkward one of the Oscars, but that's a story for another time. Um, but that's a that's a really really interesting and, and great example. I think of like just a very unique story that is only told in in one apartment. With I think it has I think it has four four characters max or something. But the way that they I'm not going to give anything away. But the way that they play with um with who those characters are and in what ways you see them is very very interesting. So I would say anybody should go check that out. I don't know if you can like stream it yet. I think you'll, I think it might still be one of those like $20 to rent kind of movies. So I would say, don't do that. Wait for yeah, it to wait, wait for it to come out. Wait for it to be cheaper and then watch it. Yeah. I think, I know what you're talking about because it's about a guy who's, who's got um, dementia, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think I know what you mean because I think over here, there was a soap opera called Emmerdale and one of the characters had it and they mm. did the whole episode central where he's looking at people he knows and sees other people instead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very much. It very much affects his just like perception of how you see it, which yeah. in a way is also very scary. It made me very it scared of having that in later life. Yeah, and it kind of made me want to do a lot more research into like dementia charities and stuff because you don't mm-hmm. you don't really think it's something that happens to other people, not you. But then mm-hmm. when you watch it, you just think, oh no, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because even though, and also how much it affects the people around you because they know what's going on, and then you they look at you and they don't recognize you, and it's like, yeah, yeah, that's scary. Um, but uh, but oh, well, on the subject of Anthony Hopkins, I forgot Hannibal. That is another <laughs> great horror movie. It's like oh, absolutely! One of my favorite horror movies and books. Mm. You've read all the books. Um, yeah, Silence of the Lambs. Oh. Yeah, that's Chill. brilliant. So amazing. Um, so, is there anything else that you want to promote? Um, anything else that I want to what like social medias and stuff? Yeah, we got that point. All right. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So find my podcast you can find it on any streaming platform it is called hollywood greenhorn um i've had a lot of really great guests on already somebody that i talked to that i think would be of great interest um is dr rebecca mckendry who she literally has a phd in horror so that's a really interesting conversation we go into jump scares and her whole thoughts on the entire art form of jump scares so that's really interesting next week we'll have lars henriks on you just heard him um so i hope you like to hear him again um <laughs> And then on social media, you can find the show at Hollywood Greenhorn on Instagram, um, at Greenhorn Pod on Twitter. 
although there's not really much on the Twitter, I would say stick to the Instagram for now. Um, yeah, if you can happen to find me through those, then good luck. Um, I should just send, send, I send it to me and then I'll put them all in the links. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I, won't, I won't put it out my, my personal Instagram, but if you find that, then, you know, have at it. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on to talk to this. I hope this was a semi-interesting and coherent conversation. It's really interesting conversation. <laughs> I had so much fun. I could talk about horror like all day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank Same. you so much, Ryan. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.